thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, first and foremost, can we just rise to our feet? I want to just give honor where honor is due first, first and foremost. Um, being up here is, is no mean feat, but the first person who deserves all the glory is God. And I want us to just bow our heads as we give him all the glory in this moment. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for personally for bringing me to this point, Lord. It's only by your hand, Lord. You tell us that it is you who produces the will and the ability to do the things of you, Lord. And I thank you for bringing me to this point, Lord. At the very same time, Lord, I thank you for all the people that you've surrounded me with, Lord, that have built me up to be able to be here, the experiences, the places that you've taken me to and that you've taken me through, Lord. And I just pray that as we speak on this word, Lord, that all of our hearts will be ready to learn, ready to receive the wisdom that comes from you, Lord. And I pray that as I speak, it is not my own articulation, Lord, but the wisdom that is of heaven, Lord. I pray that it is you that speaks, that it's you that changes hearts, Lord. And at the end of this, Lord, that it will be your glory that is reflected everywhere, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that everybody that's under my voice will leave here changed because they have understood more about you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that hearts will be transformed. Now, this will not be a lesson that we take today and leave tomorrow, but one that will transform us going forwards, Lord. So I thank you for this time, Lord. I commit this time into your hands, Lord, and everybody under my voice. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. 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 Um, first and foremost, God deserves the glory, but um, also some other people that really, really deserve a big mention. First and foremost, to Omar. Um, he's not here today, but I know he'll see this. I think he's actually in the air right now. But um, when I first came here, one of the first things I did when I came here, like the first or second Bible study I came here, I had a conversation with him. And whenever you go to a church, when you first speak to the pastor, it's a bit, mmm, because you never know how it's going to go. You might go to the church, enjoy it, you speak to the pastor, and they're just like, yeah, yeah, nice to meet you, okay, bye. But he sat down with me for a good half an hour plus, and... From that point onwards, he's always been somebody that's really believed in me. He's helped me. We've had loads of great conversations. He's always there if I need to speak to him. And guys, a lot of people think he's unapproachable because, you get me, he's a guy, he's just standing there. But he's so approachable. And now he's going to complain that I've now made his inbox larger, but I'm telling you guys. <laughs> I'm telling you, he, a massive, massive shout out to him and also to the leadership team here. Special shout out to Lewis because without him, this wouldn't actually happen. Um, so now, Lewis doesn't know this, but this is basically how this happened, guys. This is going to sound a bit crazy, but we were literally standing here. I was talking to Omar about the sermon. Oh, yeah, it was good. Da, 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 da. Then I'm talking to Lewis about the sermon. Lewis goes, Ra, when are you preaching yours? I said, when I, whenever Omar says it, he said, cool, wait there. I said, Omar, when's being preaching? Omar looks to me and says, whenever you're ready. I said, oh, right, like that. I said, okay, cool. <laughs> um, but no, um, not just Lewis, but all of the guys, you know, Tyle, Caleb, Marimish, Aunt Maggie, all of you lot, um, they've done a lot to help me, it made me feel welcome all the time, you know, with the cleaning team, guys, that was the first team I served in, amazing, amazing, and I just want to thank you all, guys, and also a special shout out to Angel as well, um, Angel's actually the person who brought me here in the first place, and also made me feel very welcome when I first came, when I didn't know anybody here, it was her, and then also a massive shout out to my family, especially my mum, she's here, um, yeah, they all deserve a shout out. This is my brother's laptop. My mom drove me here, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, a massive shout out to my family, those who are here, those who are watching, those who are abroad. And also to my friends, my amazing friends. Shout out to Manem. My mom told me not to say Manem on stage, but they had to get that shout out, man. <laughs> um, all of my friends, those who prayed with me yesterday, those who prayed with me today, those who have been, you know, helping me with my plan and all sorts, those who, I wouldn't be here without them. Like, um, you know, I have four friends in particular. Um, I know that we'll be watching. We all got saved on the same day. And if I was to never speak to them from now onwards, even still on my deathbed, there will be people who I'd always give credit to. Amazing, guys. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. Um, the choir set an amazing tone today. And then after that, Shady spoke amazingly. And some of the things that they touched on were so amazing. We heard the thing about being made whole by Christ. We heard the thing about what's in our hands, what's the garden that we have, and it's following the theme that we've had from the very beginning of this series. Omar spoken about work. When, um, when Daniel Peters came up here, and he spoke about Joseph's work as well. And the thing about work is, it's something that we all have to do in one capacity or another. Whether we've got them, we have a job, whether we're unemployed, whether we're nine to five, whether we're a businessman, we have to work. 
However, we've heard loads of calls to work, calls to steward your finance better, but at the end of the day, if you do not manage yourself and your time, all of this becomes redundant. Because you'll be, oh, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to go to work. You wake up, you're tired. When you go to work, what can you do? Nothing. And with all of this, it's important that we think about what is it that holds us back from stewarding our work in the best way possible, in the way that honors and glorifies God most. And there's a buzzword I hear going around all the time, TikTok, Insta, whatnot, even you just have conversations, oh, I'm burnt out. I'm feeling burnt out. How many times have we heard that word, guys? A lot? Mm. How many times have we experienced it? Mm. And the thing about burnout that I think is so pertinent is that whether you're a nine-to-fiver, an entrepreneur, a graduate, or high level, there's nobody that's immune to it. It's something that can hit every single person. The students, I, those late-night revision sessions, you're just waking up, you're feeling the worst. And it's something that we all experience, but a lot of the time the word gets thrown around very, very loosely without a proper understanding of what it is. And when you look into it, burnout is this state of physical, mental, or even emotional being drained, where you get to the paralyzing feeling of, I can no longer do. And this either leads to flat lines in productivity, or if not, complete drops in it. So you might be doing the bare minimum, but you wake up, you're dragging your feet, you're waking up, you just can't do it. Sometimes it's physically, even, have you ever had that feeling when you're so tired that you start to get colds and you start feeling ill even? This is what burnout does. And it's such a common, common, common thing, but we know that this life that we live, especially in Rishi Sunak's economy, is go, go, go. <laughs> when can you rest? When can you rest? It's cost of living, man. But, and so often you hear these remedies, oh, do you know what? Just work hard for a couple months, then fly Spain, fly Portugal. But how sustainable is that? How sustainable is it that we work two, three months, take a couple of weeks, go motor? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, shouts to the man in me just came out from Malta, innit? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, when you think about it, all of the series this year, we started off with family and relationships, we're in work now, and we're going to go into community and church as well. It's all about being leaders. You know, when you look at the Bible, you see so many things. We've been called to be the light of the earth, the soul of the earth, people that stand out in these spaces. And so, if we're going to be effective leaders in a space, any space, whether it's in your home, your friendship group, your workplace, how can you be an effective leader who's on three weeks, off one week for rest? On three months, off one month for rest? Imagine in a functioning country where the president is there for three months and say, guys, I'm going to have beef for a month. You'll be looking at your leader like, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you in this role? And so now, if you're somebody who's in your house three weeks and you're a parent, and then you say to the kids, yeah, basically, I need rest one week, I'm gone. <laughs> now the kids are going to think, what's for dinner? <laughs> what's going on? An effective leader cannot operate like that. However, this doesn't mean that rest can't be a thing. So let's get into this. Um, could I have Jeremiah 17, verse 7 to 8 in this? <clears throat> so, in the scripture, it's quite interesting. We see an analogy here that it starts off with, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Next. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. This analogy of a tree, leaves, fruit, we see numerous times in the Bible. We see it from the very beginning with the Garden of Eden. We see it here, and Jesus speaks about it as well. If we can have um, John 15. You see in John 15, when Jesus talks about abiding in him, he talks about abiding in him. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And we see this consistent analogy. Trees, leaves, trees, leaves. And we must ask ourselves, why? Why is this analogy so used? It's important that we look into it. But this is also a charge and an instruction. We're told to bear fruit. And in Jeremiah 17, it says this thing in every season. And so now we must beg the question, 
If we know that we're humans who need rest and burnout is a real thing, is the Bible discrediting the reality of burnout? Is it telling us that what we experience isn't real? I'd like to believe that my God isn't a gaslighting God. <laughs> and so now, clearly, there must be a way that we can bear through in every season without having to do this three months work, one month crash. There must be a way. And if you see it, the way is very, very clear. In the beginning, it starts off with something. Here you see it in John 15 about, without me, you can do nothing. In Jeremiah 17, it says, the man who trusts in the Lord. So we're given the method to do it. And so now what we're going to do is, we're going to go into this and break down the scripture in a way that we can look at each and every aspect of it and see how does this pertain to us. When we're looking at the tree, the vine, the root, the water, all of this, how does it pertain to my life? And what can this do to give me a better idea of how I can approach my work in a way that glorifies God without being scared of burnout and having to crash to zero before I can go again? Mm -hmm. So could we go back to Jeremiah 17? Okay, cool. We're here. Verse 8. Yep. Let's stop here. So he said he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. And at the very beginning of it, the biggest parallel between Jeremiah 17 and John 15 is the thing of faith. Christ talks about abiding in him. Jeremiah talks about trusting in the Lord. And can we agree that those are the same things? Cool. And this is going to be the basis of everything that we talk about here. As believers, we're called to trust in him so that we can bear fruit. And from this understanding, we're going to be able to build out a proper mechanism for how we can have a life where burnout isn't a thing. And I know that sounds crazy, but remember what we said burnout is at the beginning. That gets into the point of I cannot do, that paralysis. And I believe that the reason why Jeremiah said this thing and Jesus said it is because that reality shouldn't be our reality in Christ. Yeah. And so, when you look at it, and we're talking about trusting in the Lord, and it's abiding in Christ, the first thing it talks about is that it's a tree by the water. We get a position of the tree. It tells us that it's by the water, and the water, we can all agree, is the thing that feeds the tree. Mm -hmm. And if we look at this from this angle, so now we're looking at ourselves. So the first thing about the tree is the position. Where are we positioned? I like to believe that as believers, we're all positioned besides Christ. In Christ, it's even called in the Bible. And one of the most beautiful things about Christianity is you will seldom find a religion that tells you that the very God that created you, the very God that saved you and calls you for eternity is willing to dwell inside you. And I think it's such an underestimated thing, especially for people who grew up in Christian households. You don't realize that this is not a universal reality that all religions believe in. That the God that made you is willing to dwell inside you. It's so insane. Because it, you know the word communion? To be with somebody. Eternal communion. You are forever to be with the Lord who made you. It's a reality that we take for granted. Even because of things like drawing near to God, we misunderstand that and we start to think that means that we're away from him. No. There's a practical thing of drawing near to him in experience, in prayer, in worship. But that doesn't change the fact that you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But cool. Let's go into this a little bit. A little bit more, a little bit more. So the first thing we're talking about the position of the tree. Could I have Psalms 92, verse 12 to 13? It may seem like I'm rushing, guys, but we're just going to break down the scripture before we now get to the application of it. Just a little bit. Psalm 92, I like this scripture really, really. It's so nice. It says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And verse 13 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Again, we see position. It's not just so where are you, but it's where you are It will be where you flourish. And it's important that we remember this because it's unique to us as children of God. Because the problem is, if now you're planted in one place, but you want to flourish in another place, you will never flourish. For example, you work in finance, but you're always looking at what the guys in the legal team are doing. So, oh, but those guys got to go to this trip. Those guys got to go there. They got this project. That's not your team. Why is it your problem? So as believers, we must focus on our position. We're too busy looking at, oh, but this Steve Jobs guy, he did that. This guy did that. Is he planted in the house of the Lord? If he is, even still, he's not your tree. 
And this is the thing, comparison is something that we must temper always. I'm not saying don't look, I'm not saying don't honor people, I'm not saying don't be inspired, but remember that you are a standalone tree. And this is important. The mere fact that we are believers means that we have proximity. And therefore, we have a reassurance that we have access to all we need. We're planted in the house of the Lord. We will be there. Trust me. And now, going back to Jeremiah 17, you see also something about a tree is that it has roots, right? And the thing about roots is, I think, cool, I studied geography, and so we have to do like pH of the soil and all of those things. So it's going to get a little bit technical, but follow me, guys. You see here, right, it says planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river. And so we know that water is what fuels the tree. But for a tree to get its nutrients, its roots have to reach down and get the water. In the very same way, in our lives, we have things that reach out and get the things that give us life. So for example, um, God fuels us, right? It is by prayer that we behold God. Do you understand? So the time you spend in prayer, that's one of your roots for you to get the life that God has given to you. Do you understand? For example, uh, God has given you friends, let's say, and they pour into you, they encourage you, they build you up. The time you spend with your friends is the roots that accesses the life. Are you following? Okay, cool. And so these things, the roots, these are really, really important. Because when you look at the strength of a root of a tree, you can tell what's going to happen to that tree in the future. So for example, you see roots, right? In different seasons, roots change. So in dry seasons, people look at some of the trees in the Sahara and think, how can they operate? There's no water there. Because when a tree recognizes that there's no water there, the roots grow deeper to access the water. Do you understand? And so you can see already that a tree's roots access life. That life is how we produce fruit. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And so as you're hearing this thing about roots, think in your life, what are the things that reach out to access the life that you have? Do you understand? Whether it's the time that you set out to spend with your family, whether it's the quiet times that you scheduled in to pray, to read scripture, all of these things. Do you understand? The roots. Now we have the water. The things that the roots are reaching to get. And now something that is really, really, really important. We understand that Jesus is our living water. That's a fact. However, in that, Jesus gave us things that give us life as well. Do you understand? So, for example, you have friends that you understand are God-ordained friends. For example, I spoke about my four brothers that I mentioned before. And those are people that I can look at and say, these people are doing the work of God in my life. Do you understand? I have family. These people are doing the work of God in my life. Not every measure of life, of energy that I have will come directly from my prayer closet. There's going to be people, there's going to be places, church, fellowship settings, exercise, football sessions with the man them, all of these things that we have that give us life. However, with the understanding that Jesus is our living water, all the water that we need as believers must reflect him. So, if Jesus is our living water and it's communion with him that enables us to be productive at all, but we're also drinking some contaminated water that doesn't reflect him. What does that do to the tree? So let's say I'm a eucalyptus tree and I need cold water. I need cold water. But as my roots are searching deep under the ground, I've come across a warm water stream. But the warm water is looking kind of comfortable. Mmm. Mmm. So for example... I'm somebody who I like to read books. I like to read books, and that's something that I would say gives me life. It helps me to rest and recharge. I like to spend some time in some good literature. You understand? But there is also such thing as literature that doesn't glorify God. I was having a funny conversation with somebody the other day about a book. Um, and the book, like, it, was, it sounded like a normal, nice, you know, romance kind of storybook. You get deeper in the book, you say, wow, this is kind of explicit. <laughs> this is kind of explicit. And then you kind of ask yourself, okay, cool. I'm reading this to have some downtime to feel recharged. But then now, is this helping me to abide in Christ? Is this refilling me with things that reflect Christ? Because 
At the beginning of Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, the man that trusts in the Lord is like the tree that is like is planted near water. So there's a link that we're near God, he's the one who gives us fuel. So now we're standing near God and reaching over there for water. That doesn't look like him. And if we're talking about being planted in the house of the Lord, flourishing in the courts of the Lord, then clearly the kind of water that we need should reflect that. And there's loads of different things. Because we have physical rest. We have mental rest. We have emotional rest. Like, you know, some people, you might have some friends that you have a lot of love for them, but they can be draining at times. And... (laughs) Whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) Hey. 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 Hey, hey, hey. Damn, you never know. They might be watching. <laughs> People are saying, hey, 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 you might also be the person they're saying hey, hey about. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but if we look at water as the things that fuel us for life, and Jesus being the ultimate water, all of the other water must reflect it. Otherwise, we're getting water from different sources. And God has given provision for loads of things. When you read through the Bible, there's so many things that he's given to give us life. Even Paul says, physical exercise is good, but spiritual exercise is also more needed. You need both. He talks about the Sabbath. The Sabbath, I think, is something that we're really starting to um, kind of do away with, in a way. You go to church on Sunday, then after, oh, what? Where are we going next, man, then? Oh, we're outside. And I'm not saying that there's always something wrong with linking up with your friends, because that can be rest in itself. But is it always, especially when you know you need physical rest, are you responding to your body and giving it the fuel that it needs? Not necessarily. <clears throat> and in any basic sense, we know that when a plant or a tree has no water, it produces no fruit. And that's a basic principle. No water, no fruit. And if we're called to produce fruit in every single season, we need to make sure that we're keeping up with our water. But this also does mean real water as well. Oh, what did you drink this week? Oh, I had KA, Sun Exotic. Where's, where's the water? Where's the water? Because this producing fruit, there's a physical aspect to it. Who say, oh, I've been feeling really tired this week, you know? Oh, right, what did you eat this week? I had Morley's, McDee's, KFC. Where did you think you were going to get your energy from? And in the Bible, it talks about food as nourishment as well. You see the scripture that they talk about um, man doesn't feed on bread alone. Yeah, man doesn't feed on bread alone. Not bread, not at all. He said alone. Bread as well. But as, as a Christian, our rest kind of has to look a little bit different. Because one of the most beautiful things that I enjoy about being a Christian is that I know that if I drop everything, there's somebody holding it. Whereas if you're not a Christian, you don't always have that eternal failsafe. And my sister bought me a book for my birthday. It's an amazing book. I'd actually recommend everybody reads it. It's called The God of Psalms 23. I don't know what the... It's something Gibson or something like that. Harry or David. One of those names, isn't it? But it talks about the fact... It, talks, it goes through... The whole book is on Psalms 23, but the way he breaks it down is immaculate. And he stops... In the first chapter, it's just about the first line. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he stops on the first clause. The Lord is my shepherd. And I'm sure we've all heard that psalm a hundred times. But... When you look at the Hebrew, it says that the word used is Yahweh. And Yahweh being, I am that I am. And he says something so amazing that I'd never thought about once. I am that I am. None of us can say that because I am because my mother gave birth to me. I am the man that I am today because my friends made me who I am. Or because my family built me up. Because of the school experiences I had. God is who he is because of himself. God is love because he's God. God is merciful because he's God. And all of these understandings are because he's a law unto himself. And so the person that you're depending on to watch over the things that you have, he doesn't, he's not under the influence of anybody or anything. And so if he has brought himself this far, he will continue. He is eternal because it's who he is. And when I look at rest, the, the definition that I like to use, because I feel like there's no dictionary definition that factors in God when you talk about rest, is leaving burdens at the feet of God, allowing your body and mind to recharge. Because all these things on your shoulders and on your head, you've left it to him. And you said, let me bake off. Let me relax. Let me have some time away. And recharging must be intentional, because recharging is also a water. 
it's also something that gives you life. Nobody here would use their phone to the point of 1% and then just let it die. You say, oh, my phone, 10% warning, you're looking for your charger. <laughs> but anyway. But yeah, and it's important because otherwise you find yourself worrying a lot. You find yourself worrying, and there's this saying, I'm going to butcher it slightly because I don't know exactly what it is, but I say that worrying is like going through the same pain twice because you're worrying, then you do it, and you go through it again. And if you're always carrying your burdens on your head instead of leaving them in the lap of God, you will go through them twice because you haven't given it to him and then said, cool, when the day comes, we'll cross that bridge. But until then, I know God's got it. And when I get there, I know he'll be with me. But yeah, let's continue. So fruits. Now we see in verse 8, it talks about producing fruit. Fruit are the thing that the tree is meant to produce. They're the thing that represent the fact that there's energy in this tree. If you walked past the road and saw a tree with no fruits on it, you'd assume that it's dead, dying, or out of season, right? But when you see a human, we don't look at it in the same way. You're not producing anything, but you're just walking around. And as a Christian, if one of the charges that you have is to produce fruit in every season, we should be looking at ourselves like that because it's what God has called us to do. So when we look at our lives and we're not producing any fruit, we must start questioning the tree, the water, and all of these things. But the fruit not only represents life of the tree, but it also gives an opportunity for people to be blessed by the tree. When a mango tree makes fruits, it's not for the tree. The tree has its roots, it has its own systems inside it. The mango is for those who will pick it. And so when we're called to produce fruit, it's not for us. It's for people to experience the things that we produce and vice versa. I'm going to eat from my shadies. It's going to come to my tree as well. And see, I'm going to have the mango, going to have the apple. Pause. Cool. <laughs> No, I had to because men were giving me eyes. <laughs> but the thing about fruits is, guys, is that when you see an apple tree, you know it's meant to produce apples. But if I see my mum, I don't necessarily know, apart from her being a good mother to me, I don't know what her life is supposed to look like. I don't know what God has called her to do. That's between her and God. And this is the problem why we also must not watch other people's fruits because you don't know what they've been called to produce. So for example, yeah, you can see somebody, they're running a business, it's going well. Say, what? He's blo Ay, this guy is blown, man. He's left the ends, he's, he's going off. You don't know what's going on in his quiet time. God could be rebuking him every day. He's like, but God, I want to make the money. And this is why you shouldn't watch other people's fruits. You shouldn't. Because how do you know what a person is meant to be producing? But don't get it twisted. We're going to go there soon. We're going to go there. The next seasons, dry seasons, this is when conditions have been made hard to bear fruit. So here it talks about a drought, it talks about dry seasons. For us, it might look like pressurized times at work. It might look like family troubles. It might look like your friends are becoming draining. You're going low on money. All of these things that make it hard for you to produce fruit. Are we getting it? Cool. And <clears throat> when you don't watch these things, you will get to a place where you are not producing fruit. And this is what burnout for the Christian looks like. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not producing no fruit, you'll be producing low fruit. So that's either low in quantity or low in quality. And regardless, you're not operating how God has called you to operate. And it's not a slight on you necessarily, but it's more so a slight on how you're viewing God. Because God is saying, abide in me and you will produce the fruit. Trust in me, come before me and you will produce that fruit. And I had a very interesting time when I came out of uni. I came out of uni and uni was great. That summer after uni was great. We were in Paris with the guys. I was in Greece with the family. We were enjoying life. I had a job patterned already. So in that time we said, we're going to spend the money. It's going to come back in a few months. We're fine. <laughs> it's going to come back. It's going to come back. But um, then September came. I started my new job. It was good. I enjoyed it. Um, but especially at the beginning, I was in the office all the time, every day, you know, trying to acclimatize to the new place, get to know the people. At the same time, I was also running a fellowship. I was also getting used to a new church. I had a couple of family members that were in and out of hospital for the first few months. And so some of the weeks were looking like office, hospital, home, house visits, home, f prep for fellowship, go home, sleep, office, repeat. And then weekend, 
You know, you just started work, but you still want to keep a social life. You don't want to become those guys. So Saturday, oh, man, them link up. Okay, cool, we're dead and we're here. And it became a lot. But I said, ah, oh. but these are things I enjoy. And I remember I called my friend Daniel. Um, and I said, bro, I remember it was a late night. It was like 11 p.m. I was coming back from my dad's house. I had to just go and take him something. And I said, bro, this is a lot, man. Work in the morning, it's like 11 p.m. I'm not even home yet. Money was even low. Because see, I said I was spending in summer. What I forgot was that the first month of work, you don't get paid to the end. I wasn't ready. I was not ready at all. I was not ready. And I called him. I said, bro, this is just a lot. Like, I enjoy all of these things. What do I drop? How do I drop it? And he said this thing to me. He said, Bian, this is growing pains. You're in a new time. You're, this is the beginning of your adult life. Acclimatizing to this is not going to be easy. That was a warning that I didn't listen to. Because now, some prior months before that, I was praying. It was around April, May, coming to exam time at uni. And God was like, be preparing for the new season you're walking into. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be more intense. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, I'm going to have a job. I'm going to go back home. Yeah, it's making sense. Ah, I wasn't making sense. Because you know the ones that like, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to prepare. You didn't prepare. So now the time has come, and it was a lot more emotionally draining than I thought it would be. Things were just kind of coming left and right. You're acclimatizing to moving back home. You know, in uni, you wake up, cook dinner whenever you want, sleep when you want, you wake up when you want. 9 a.m., you're tired. Ah, you're not there. Sorry, mommy, but sometimes 9 a.m., we weren't there. <laughs> we weren't there. <laughs> we were not there. And... <clears throat> Long story short, it got to around the end of November, beginning of December, I just crashed. You see, a lot of my friends think I don't go to the office. Firstly, that's not true. Secondly, that's when it started. Like, I remember one day I just woke up and I said, I just can't. I woke up, I was even on time, ready to go. I just said, I just couldn't do it. And then even everything just started to become a hard slog. Waking up, you're dragging your feet. I need to go visit this person. Like, oh, I need to go and do this thing. You start doing things, it's like you're running on empty. My work started getting a bit sloppier. You know, you know deadlines more time that you'll make a week beforehand. Now, the day of, you've just about made it. Uh, and the next thing you know, oh, we've got fellowship tomorrow, I haven't planned. Tommy knows about those days saying, wow, when did you plan the session? I said, on the train, bro. <laughs> on the train. And then they come and they said, wow, we couldn't tell. I said, it's the grace of God. <laughs> it's the grace. And, but this is another danger that I realized about being a Christian. When God asks you to do certain things, some things he will let you fail and see this is what happens when you don't trust me. But certain things he will keep you going. And so you sometimes don't realize that you're really running on empty. Yeah. And then we, when we got to December, uh -uh, it was finished. It was finished. I, I stopped going into work. I was working from home. Luckily, because it was getting to December time, I kind of could. You know, December office is getting quiet. But I was just out of it. I, I couldn't. I really couldn't. World Cup started, so I kind of got lucky. Everybody would, I would just sit and watch football, and it gave me an excuse to be lazier. But I just couldn't. My quiet times, you know when you're praying five, ten minutes, yeah, I, we prayed today. I just, you prayed and just go. And I was looking for, I had a Ghana trip at the end of the month. I, you know when you're just working every day, hoping, when is this holiday going to come? Can it come? The, hey, and guys know about some of those Microsoft Teams tricks, man. Something, I was just waiting for the days to go and I realized when I got to go and I said, for the past four weeks, ask me what piece of work I'd completed. None. Every single fellowship session that I was doing, they were good. People said they enjoyed them. They asked me, asked me what I'd said in the session. No clue. Uh, no clue. And it's like, sometimes people couldn't realize I was done, but oh, I woke up, I knew I was done. And now... All the things God has said to me, I was like, ah, it's making sense now. It's making sense. And the funny thing is I have some of my quiet time notes from that time, and I'm going to just read them out quickly, and you can kind of see what was going on in that time. So this is um, 28th of October, 2022. Going from a season from preparing to carry to actually carrying, that's the pain and the struggle. The submission of last season needs to be built on, not lent on. You don't get filled up to the point of happiness, then leave the source. Continue to be fed as you're in the happiness or you'll dry up. Some burdens are for you and God. Some are for you and the people God gives you. Be present in the presence. That was October. We didn't listen. <laughs> we didn't listen. And I remember um, in Ghana, we had a long drive, five hours, and I didn't want to sleep. Me and my boy Axe, we stayed talking the whole time, and I was just reflecting. I was like, yeah, like, I realized, like, I just wasn't handling well. Because I was like, it's going all right. It's we haven't hit zero yet. Then I hit zero. I said, oh. And this is the problem. And so, I realized that burnout happens when one of three things happens. 
Lack of water, the roots of the tree have become weak, or in a dry season, you're trying to produce the same as in a regular season, so you start to find yourself strained. And what I want us to talk about, firstly, is about knowing your fruits. Because if you can know what you're supposed to be producing, then you won't get to this place. Well, actually, that's a lie. You might still get there, but you can have a better view of how getting there looks, so you can start to do preventative measures. But knowing what you're producing isn't that easy. Because as believers, it's like we're all supposed to be producing the fruits of the Spirit, kindness, self-control, discipline, and all these things. And then we all live different lives at the same time, so it's kind of like, ooh, what does my version of success look like compared to his? How do I know what God is calling me to do in this time? But the thing is, right, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are Christ's workmanship, that we're created for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the beauty of that is we see that God has tasks and things for us to pour into that he's pre-prepared for us. And it's a beautiful thing because it shows the intentionality of God. You know, people talk about this thing of, oh, he knew you before you were born. It's a real thing that God genuinely looked over you and made you in a particular way so that you can do specific things. And the beautiful thing about fruits that I came to recognize was that the things that God asks you to do, you often kind of bail out on because it's like, oh, let's say you're a teacher. I'm feeling tired today. Do you know what? The kids, they're just going to have to go along with a makeshift lesson. But what you don't recognize is that the fruits that God asks you to do are things so that you can see his glory. Because when you see how you were late up at night and God just gave you an idea for the lesson, then after a kid comes up to you, miss that lesson, it really changed the way I saw this topic that I never used to get. Then you'll start to realize, wow, God is really working. And I know before I said that fruits are for other people, but when you see the enjoyment of these fruits in other people, you see just how intentional God is in working through you. And a little side note, for all you people who don't like to evangelize, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say this, but you see, yeah, a lot of people think, oh, like, I don't want to do it. Oh, like somebody else will spread the message to the lost. But one of the most beautiful things about evangelism is that, first things first, you stepping out and speaking to people, that's a fruit of your faith. That's the first thing. Secondly, when you see people's heart postures change right in front of you, you get a snapshot of God's glory reflecting out of you. And you leave it thinking, if God can do this in just a one-minute conversation, what can he do in a season of my life? And so you're scared to evangelize. I don't know how to speak to strangers and all of this stuff. We have people here who went to Netherlands and they, before a year, that would have said, I'll never speak to a stranger. And they went there and souls were saved. Kids were crying on the street and all sorts of things. And now they can step away from that and say, wow, God really did a work in me and he produced a fruit out of me. By seeing people enjoy the fruit you produce, then you'll realize that God is really doing a real thing in you. And the thing about this knowing your fruits things, when you can recognize this is what I'm meant to be producing, then it's also something that keeps your faith going. Because if your faith is about communion with God, a oneness with God, right, then you'll start to see that this is how partnership works. If you're in a business partnership that produced nothing, you would leave, no? And this is why people sometimes fall out of love with the faith. They left church because you didn't think you were supposed to be producing anything. You thought that was for the higher-ups. Oh, I'll leave that to those guys. They've been in the faith for years. They're the ones doing all the hard work. They're the ones on the streets. They're the ones doing everything for God. I'll just kind of keep it minimal. The thing about not selling yourself out to God completely is that you will never produce quality fruits. Quality fruits make you look and say, wow, God did a work. Could I have Philippians 2.13, please? And when we see this scripture, that it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure, it sounds as though God wants to produce fruit out of you so that he's happy. But when God is pleasured in the fruits out of you, you experience it because you're one with him. His pleasure is your pleasure. There's a saying that they say that we are most satisfied when God is most glorified. And if you've given your life to Christ, you're a believer, a child of God. Have you ever had like your parent have like maybe a birthday or a job promotion and they're really happy you know the joy that puts in a child's face they just celebrate with their parents for no reason it's because you share that joy with your father and how much more when you worked on it together so when you can know the areas and it sounds really difficult but it's not look at what God's put in your hand Shady spoke about it what's your garden 
Are you a parent? You know you need to be producing fruit in your area of your house. You have a job. Are you producing fruit there? And I'm saying this to me as well because sometimes I'm not producing fruit there. <laughs> you have friends. How much are you pouring into their lives? You have all of these different areas and people are so quick to say, what's my calling? What's my destiny? Stop thinking about down there. Start thinking about right here. What's in your hands? You know what they say, this, this saying, it's in the Bible. People say it in movies. Oh, those who are trusted with little, they'll be trusted with a lot more. Handle what's in front of you well and God will take you further. And it's not a matter of, oh, why am I waiting? It's, can you be trusted? Because you say this now, then God, when God takes you to that place and now you're like, God, I can't handle this. What were you expecting? You didn't get used to producing fruit with your master at the first level. And so, know your fruits. Know that God is working in you to produce these fruits. And one of the ways that we can know this is just a simple observation of your life. Where am I right now? What places has God put me in to produce good things? Is it my home? Is it my friendship group? Is it my fellowship that I've been serving at? Is it my job? Start with the basics. Is it my finances? Where do I need to be producing fruit? So that's the first thing about preventing burnout, knowing your fruits. Second thing is prioritization. Now, cool. This thing that says that the whole idea of God working in us to produce things, right? God gives you the fuel to produce things that he's asked of you. So if we use, let's say, some units, right? Let's say God's given you 100 units of energy and you have five things. You could divide it 20, 20, 20, 20, right? Then now you said, ah, oh, so you know your capacity is already limited. But a man named going motor though. You know you're tired. You're running on empty. You said, I'm still going to go though. Then now you went there and now your home life is a bit of a wreck. Your job is falling apart. You've come back to uncompleted work because the fuel that God gave you was to do certain things and you didn't do it. And um, there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 7, right? And it can sound like it's out of context, but Paul says this thing of, as God has distributed to each one, so let him walk as he has been called. And the context of it was he was talking about single people, married people, etc. But what's so interesting that he's saying, whatever your status is, wherever you're at in life, with what God has given you there, walk in that way. And so we must all recognize that we all have different things to produce. And as long as this is the case, then we need to focus on our tree and prioritize accordingly. So cool, guys. This is an exercise that I had done once upon a time, and I said, let me list my priorities. And by that, it will determine how I put my time, my effort, my energy. And something that I need you guys to hear when I'm saying this in it. This is not about the things I cared about most. This is what at the time I knew I needed to focus on and pour into. This is the list. Number one, God. Number two, me. That's health, mind, my sleeping pattern, my walk with Christ, my peace, etc. Number three, my work. So I was in getting my job actually done. Number four was um, my podcast and my evangelism thing. Number five was family, and we'll get into why family was five in a second, don't worry. Number six was my social life. Number seven was my finances. And number eight was my career development. So the other things that I did to further my career. And then you ask the question, how can family be that low? Because I'm fortunate enough, firstly, to have really good relationships with my siblings and a lot of people in my family. So it didn't require so much effort because we had things working already that was allowing me to produce fruit. However... In my life, my sleeping pattern has been a wreck for a very long time. Very long time. Anybody who's known me for more than six months knows that. <laughs> and so I knew I needed to put more effort into that, so it was really high on the list. My finances are seven, and it's not because I don't care about my finances. It's because, by God's grace, I've had people in my life for over ten years that have taught me how to budget, how to save, etc., etc. So that's why I was low down. And so when I saw this list, you see the first five things. These are the priorities, the main ones. And when I'm feeling low, then I say, okay, cool. These things start to go. And the thing about prioritization, we're talking about dry seasons, right? When you start to feel tired, you know you cannot give the same amount to everything. Are you lot hearing me? Is God all of you lot's number one priority? Hmm? Is God you lot's number one priority? Okay, cool. The beautiful thing about putting God number one above yourself is this. You give your everything to somebody who's given you everything already. You never need to worry about taking care of yourself first because God has already done that. Are we following? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
And so the thing about prioritization is that you now have a blueprint for your life to say, okay, cool, as soon as I recognize I'm getting tired, these things right at the bottom, number eight, we're gonna give it less time. And with each priority, you should have commitments for them. So for example, um, for God, you have your quiet time, right? Yes? Do you have church attendance, right? Cool. And so for your number one priority, those are commitments that cannot go. Am I right? Let's say you link up with your friends four times a week. As soon as you're tired, should that not go down? But instead what we'll do is run it to the ground till we're tired and it goes to zero. When you have your priorities, you can scale back a little bit. Do you understand? And in Luke chapter 5, if we could all turn there quickly. Luke chapter 5, verse 15 to 16. We're going we're gonna to read something quickly that it says here. And we see something very interesting. So basically, Jesus has healed somebody and he told the guy, keep it on the low, right? However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And now, say this guy's with me. So he himself often what? Withdrew. Say it louder. Withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus understood that he had a ministry to cater to. And that was a big priority for him. But he also understood that he is God. And so that time away, that union of God was necessary for him to maintain himself. Do you understand? And so he recognized, I'm going to step away. And none of us would ever say that Jesus' ministry wasn't important. But he understood the necessity of rest. And if this is my priority, cool. We're going to make sure that I'm recharged for it. We often like to think that strength looks like power and through tiredness to the point that you're so weak. That's backwards. Strength looks like preserving your strength so that you can use it best. Are we following? Cool. And so this prioritization is personal. Somebody might be having family problems, so that has to go right to the very top. Somebody might be in a very intense time in their job, so that goes to the very top. And I'd even advise assessing this on a monthly basis because different times and seasons are going to draw different things out of you, require different things out of you. Do you understand? Cool. cool. Could you bring back John chapter 15? John chapter 15. We must, in order to prevent burnout, care for your water. I mentioned it before about contaminated water. But the thing is that we are often in charge of the things that we consume, are we not? So if you're taking downtime to rest, to watch TV, these are good things to rest on. But not if you're now having restful times that diminish your ability to produce fruit after. So now, you're watching TV. You know you struggle with lust. You're now watching a show that's very explicit. So then now, when it comes to you producing fruit in your relationship, you're now running into sin instead of producing fruit. So now, for example, you know that you, when you drink alcohol, you have very bad hangovers. But said, you know what, it's Sunday, I'm going to rest, have a nice one at the bar with the guys. So now, you go home, you have hangover, work on Monday, uh, headache. you tell your manager, I have a bad flu, can I have sick leave? No, you need Panadol, not sick leave. <laughs> and this is the thing, guys. So we must understand, are we caring for our water or are we lying to ourselves about what's giving us life? We have so much agency over what we consume, but we like to blame it on, ah, oh, I just saw it on my timeline. You're now scrolling on the timeline, you're seeing nyash. You're seeing footage. On top of that, you might even be seeing the complete opposite. You might be seeing, oh, I'd love to have her body. Oh, I'd love to look like that. So now you come off of your restful time on Instagram thinking like this. And now you're worrying. Now you're anxious. Now you're doubting. And then now when it comes to producing fruit, you're not able. And so it's important that if you want to be a vessel for honor, as the Bible says that we should be, that you are intaking like one. John chapter 15 is up. He says, abide in me as I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. The condition that Jesus gave for us producing fruit is abiding in the vine. If now you're depending on things that are not looking like what you're supposed to abide in, your fruit that comes out of it will reflect that. You'll be producing bad fruit. So for example, if a fruit is whatever a tree is producing, 
Oftentimes, if you're producing lust, it's probably due to something that you intook. If you're producing laziness, it's probably because of how you're treating yourself. Are we following? Cool. And so this is why it's important. When you look at a car, let me ask a question. In fact, no, I'm not going to bait out some of the guys. Some of the guys in here have some very nice cars. I come to church, I see 22 plates. I see 23 plates. I see 24 plates. Would any of you ever take your 24 plate Mercedes and put the wrong fuel in it? Why? What did you say? You value it. You value it. So you wouldn't put the wrong fuel in your car because you value it. Has anybody ever seen what's happened to a car that's running on the wrong fuel? It's gone. It's finished. And so that's how you treat your car. Your car will combust from the wrong fuel. How you treat yourself that's supposed to be the temple of the living God, you don't treat it like that. Is it because you don't care about the production of the car? Or because you know that God's given you grace, you said, let me abuse it. I'm so sorry because I know I'm giving these lot a headache because you see all the scriptures I gave them, yo, just went a different way, but it's all in God's hands. In the beginning of Romans chapter 6, can we go there quickly? Romans chapter 6. In my personal opinion, this is my favorite delivered scripture in the whole of the Bible. I'm, we're all going to read out verse 1 to verse 2 in the NKJV. Does everyone have NKJV on them? Do you, does everyone have NKJV on them? Cool. Verse 1 and verse 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? You see that certainly not, there's an exclamation mark there. Some scriptures even say, God forbid. Sin is disobedience to the will of God. Do we agree? We do. So it is sinful to disobey God. God has asked you to abide in him. You're abiding in sin. Why? Because of grace. And we know that this is the case. Because we know that we can afford to and the car is not going to stop running. But regardless, you're still a tree. Put the wrong fuel in it, you'll produce the wrong fruit. Produce the wrong fruit, you will not see the glory of God produced in your life. It's just a fact. And so care for your water. You're a vessel that God cares about. And in that very same way, you should care about it. And then also, root watching. I spoke about roots earlier, guys, right? You see a tree. A tree doesn't stop producing fruits when it stops getting water. That's not what happens. For a period of time, the roots in the tree will kind of hold some water there. So when the water's stopped and gone dry, they still got some reserves there. And so for a period of time, it could be weeks, it could be days. There's going to be a period of time whereby the tree's still producing fruits, but it's not drawing on any new water. But in that period of time, it's a ticking time bomb. Give it a couple of days and the tree is going to go dead. Are we following? Has anybody here experienced a time where you're still producing stuff, but you're starting to feel worse, but everything around you looks the same? And what does that tell you is happening? You're going where? Downhill. And when you're going downhill, it's a thing that can be stopped because we have God. But we often don't stop it because we don't think there's a problem. We think, no, I'm just having a bad week today. I'm just, I'm just feeling a bit tired. I'll sort it out tomorrow. But what we must recognize is that it's time for us to start looking at our roots before we stop producing fruits. So, for example, all the things that give you life, that are access to you getting life, your church attendance is starting to go down. Sometimes, yeah, you need a week off, maybe you're ill, maybe you need to rest. But now two, three, four weeks, you're not there. Why? And I'm not saying this because I want you to come to church. This is Omar's church. You lot's tires do nothing for my pockets. <laughs> However, I recognize, could we have... Hebrews 10.25, if I asked you guys for it. If I didn't, apologies. I actually might not have, but it's, I'll read it out regardless. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In some translations it says, Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Do not forsake the fellowship of the brethren. And this was something that was given as an instruction because as believers, you need other believers to hold you up. I remember there was a time, Abraham's in here. Where's Abraham sitting? 
I haven't seen him since. Oh, Abraham's gone. There was a time in the old building I came to church. I had a bad week. I don't know what happened that week. But you know when you've made it to church? Nowadays, if you come to Arkham, 12.30, you're not making it in. Those days, in a bad week, I might get here, 12.45, worship's ending, grab a seat at the back. Yeah, I know. Some of you lot are thinking, what? Yeah, there was a time. There was a time. <laughs> there was a time. Um, and I remember I had a bad week. I wasn't even going to come. I said, let me just do it. And then I think there was prayer at the end of service, and Abraham just came and just prayed for me shortly. And it just, you know when someone prays for you like they saw your whole week? And I said to him, I said, you, it was no longer than 30 seconds to a minute. I said, I didn't even know I needed that encouragement and it completely changed how I saw my week and this is what the gathering of the saints can do this is why church is important this is why fellowship is important speaking to your friends it's important for these things it's so so important and Matthew eleven twenty eight. you know the scripture of come to me all who are weary he didn't say come to me all who are dead Jesus does give life for sure but he said come to me before you get there so I can refill you there's a reason why he didn't say, come to me, all who are dead. Can we have the First Kings 19 scripture on here? Anybody who's spoken to me about the Bible for more than 20 minutes, you've heard this scripture, but we're going to go there again. First Kings 19, guys, I'm going to give some context. Has anybody heard of Jezebel? Does anybody know Jezebel? Whoa, who said yes? <laughs> Somebody knows Jezebel. Cool. Jezebel, people often talk about her as like a whoring kind of woman. But one of the things that Jezebel did was that she was a supporter slash friend of the prophets of Baal. Baal being satanic worship, demonic worship, etc. Right? God gave Elijah, the prophet of Israel, an instruction. He said, kill all the prophets of Baal. I don't think he's asking you lot to go in any massacres, but it's what he asked the prophet of Israel to do at the time. And basically, after he did this, Jezebel sent him a letter and said, when I catch you, I'm going to kill you. And that's not a paraphrase. She said, I'm going to kill you when I catch you. And so he ran scared into the desert. And when I say he ran scared, guys, I'm not talking about some any next guy from Hackney who's just working nine to five. I'm talking about the ordained, chosen by God, prophet of Israel got scared by a death threat. Somebody who was seen as mature by the Lord to run this place ran to the desert. And then this is what happens. He says to God, I want to die. And this is what happens. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. We have the next one as well. Says, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals, a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Now you see, guys, if Elijah was at his end, he would have finished it. But he wasn't there yet. But he realized he was going down and see what he did? He went to God in prayer. And I'd beg you to think for a second. When you feel like you want to end it and you're done, what do you go to first? And I'm not saying that you don't go to God, but when did you go to him and was it first? Because this changes a lot. Because Elijah went to God first, he was given food and told to rest. Because you went to Rodway first, you got pain music first. Like, they even said the bottle dropped. Wow. Are you shocked? You can't be shocked. You were sad, you went to sad music, you became more sad. What a surprise. Who would have thought? <laughs> And the thing is about him is that he looks like he's at the end, but he isn't because he still had the energy to go to God. And this is what root watching looks like. I've realized I can't handle this anymore. I've realized things are going downhill. Elijah realized I can't lead this country anymore. So he went to God. I've realized I don't have the energy to link the man them anymore. So I went to God. You've realized I can't give it my all at work anymore. So I went to God. Because I've realized I don't want to go to the office anymore. Hmm, why might that be? My roots are dying. The man them are calling you. Oh, let's step out. We're just going to go chill. Oh, no, I'll come next time. I'm, I'll come next time. And this is also a message for you to speak to your friends properly. Ask them, are you okay? What's going on? They, you see three, four times they don't want to come out. Pull up at their house. Because if they say, Rah, oh, man, them, there's things here. You're there. You're there. You're there. Straight away. Man, them say, Come out, I'll, help, I'll pay half your ticket. You're there. Sorry, I'm just using motor because it's, it's current, isn't it? 
But this is the thing. When you start to look like you're going towards your end, where do you run to? Watch your roots. Assess your life and think, okay, cool. All the things that give me life, where do I access them? Because as soon as you can identify that, when those start going downhill, you know you need to run to God. And the most beautiful way to make this a practice in your life is to run to God anyway. There's a guy called Brother Lawrence. He wrote a book in about the 17th century. It's called Practice in the Presence of God. When I first saw the title, I thought it was going to be this mystical prayer closet, how to experience God at a new level kind of vibe. And I'm not really here for some of that stuff. I like more practical, scripture-based, who is God? Let me understand his character. And he was a monk. And he said this interesting thing. He said that at a time, he was the kitchen cleaner in the monastery. And how he started to practice the presence of God was he'll be washing up and he'll look out the window and see the trees and say, wow, the glory of God has made this thing that produces fruits. He'll be on a walk and he'll see the sun and say, wow, God is so glorious. When you start to see God in the everyday, then running to him becomes the norm. So then now you see your roots going down, but you know where you're running to. You see, I got out of bed this morning, I was really tired, but it's cool, I know where I'm going. And this is really, really, really important. And now, I had a similar situation to my 22 at the end of 2023. Similar time. This is why, you know, my friendship group, everybody knows that October, November time for BN, you have to just be on standby because you never really know what's about to happen. <laughs> it all might just explode. It might all go left. I might start saying, oh, man, damn, I'm tired. I don't know. And now we got to this time again, and I started to feel a similar kind of way. I came out, I, to be honest, I do think a part of it is how I handle my summer, but I'm growing as a nine to five. I'm understanding I can't live summer how I used to as a student, but we'll get there soon. But anyways, similar things. People were in and out of hospital. We had a bereavement in the family. Um, work was getting more intense because now, after a year in my job, they just start treating you like a normal worker, so you actually have to do the jobs. And it's like, it was becoming a lot. I started serving here as Bible study leader, and it was just getting a little bit much. But I realized something. I said, we've been here before. I know what to do. And so if I read out to you what I wrote on, this is the 11th of November. It says this, is there a difference between thanksgiving and praise? If praise is expression of joy in God, how is that not linked to performance? If we see God in what he establishes through us. When I realized I wasn't establishing well, things were not producing, I realized thanksgiving is the key. 6th of November, I just wrote a scripture, Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. And I hope that between the two years' comparisons, you can see what started to happen when I started looking at my roots. I realized I was getting tired. I said, in the Psalms, we're there straight away. Are you seeing, guys? And the beautiful thing about this is that it prepared me for the hardest season of my life to date. Shortly after this, I broke my ankle, which was a real shame. It had some nice things about it. Sick leave was great. However, a lot of pain. And then shortly after that, my grandma passed away. And it has been and is the hardest thing I've ever been through. But when it came, as difficult as it was, I felt prepared. I had maintained my friendship with my friends. I had been a part of community here. So now when this time came, my roots were maintained. My access to what was giving me life was still there. I cried many, many tears, but I had people to wipe them for me. I had burdens, but I had people to share them with. Do you get what I'm saying? I had all of these things going on, but I understood God had me. And in Isaiah 6, there's a hymn I used to love. Um, and it talks about, here I am, Lord. I will go, Lord. And it's like, when God makes that call for you to turn up and produce fruit in a hard season, will you be there? Will you be there? I'd like to hope so. But you will not be there if you do not watch your roots. If you've run out of energy for the season that needs you most. You got to the time of fatherhood, you had a child, and you were not there because you didn't watch your fruits. You didn't watch your water. You didn't watch your roots. And... This is really important because in the hardest seasons, in the driest seasons, God still promises to sustain you. When we spoke about God being a father, it's because he always provides. And as I end, the last thing, the very last thing, if we could go back to Jeremiah 17, um, the verse 8 part, we see something at the end. It says, We'll not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. In the hardest season of your life, God asks of you to produce fruit and it seems like why is he asking so much of me when I have so little to give 
Because what you produce in your hardest seasons will show you that God is good. There's a, there's a gospel song, let my life show that God is good. In the hardest seasons, when you see that God is still producing things out of you, it's a reminder and a telltale that he's there for you. You see? And this is something that is so, so important. But now we ask the question, what does that season look like for us? What is drought? Before we said a dry season is that which makes the conditions difficult for us to still produce fruit. Do you get it? Are we there? Do we know what a dry season is? Have we had a dry season before? Okay. And now in this time, we go through seasons, but our seasons are personal to us because they're down to our lives. And so we mustn't be comparing in seasons. We mustn't be looking at, but this guy's business is flourishing, mine is not. You started your business two weeks ago, he's been doing this for two years. Why are you comparing? You're in different seasons. Your finance guy, April, May, you're in the office till nine. It's the end of the financial year. You're seeing your friends in HR, they're even leaving 4.30 on a Friday, casual wear. Yeah, we're going to the pub, guys. You, you're not there because it's a different season for you. Your wife is pregnant, so you can't go out with the guys. But you're saying, oh, but they got to go out. Of course not. You're preparing for childbirth. You're in a different season. It's requiring different things of you. Could we have Nehemiah 1 4 up, please? This thing is such a simple principle that we saw with Elijah and we see with Nehemiah. Context again. He was working in Persia. Jerusalem's walls were crumbling. He was from Jerusalem. He's, he was like, Rah, my people are suffering. And this is what happens. So it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. In his tears, in the hardest season, he was away from home as a wealthy man and could do nothing about it. He worked for the king before even speaking to the king, before telling his friends. Some of you, you're in a tough season. The first person that knows is your Instagram close friends. You haven't even updated God. Even I know what's going on in your workplace before he does. I don't even know you like that, bro. <laughs> and God, who's dwelling within you, doesn't know what's going on yet. If you haven't told him, you haven't revealed it to him, how can he respond to you? How can he work on that for you? He may do it behind the scenes, and that's the beautiful thing about God. He will make sure you never get too low. But you're not producing a fruit that allows you to see his glory face to face. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 talks about us beholding his glory so that we can be conformed into the same image. How can you be conformed into a glory you're not seeing? How can you be conformed to a God that you do not know? How can you be conformed to a God that you don't depend on? It's not possible. When the heat gets higher, you lean into your fuel more. But this cannot happen if you're not aware of what's going on around you. Are you aware of your seasons? And recognize what your season is requiring of you. Fruits may be produced at different times, but they will look different depending on your season. In your hardest times, sometimes a fruit is you being able to get up and function. Sometimes it's you being consistent in going to work. If you're a graduate at a job and you're a manager, your fruits are going to look different, but that's necessary. And all of this is to round off with the point that we are given the charge of producing fruit. Burnout stops us from producing fruit. So God gave us a blueprint for us to be able to produce fruit in every season. And a lot of it comes by us recognizing where we're standing with God. So that when we are no longer producing fruit or going downhill, we can turn to him and say, God, I need more. God, I'm struggling. God, can you help me? And that's why there's five key things that I said that I want you to remember, guys. Number one, know your fruits. Observe your life and know what you need to be producing. Number two, know how to prioritize. When the going gets tough, what's at the bottom of the list that can go out? Number three, care for your water. Watch what you're consuming, the fuel that gives you life. Number four, watch your roots, the things that give access to that gives you life. Are you maintaining them well? Do they need to be strengthened? Do you need to add to them? Do you need to take away from them? What's going wrong? Number five, seasons. Observe your life. And with all of these things, if you can't observe it, seek God. Fast, pray. Nehemiah did it. The beauty of fasting is that you remove the excess noise and say, God, I'm at your feet. I have no direction. Give me some. And these five things will allow you to observe your life in a way that we will not run out of fruit. We will produce fruit in every season. And guys, before we wrap up, in Matthew 5, 16, 
There's such a beautiful thing that Jesus says. Let your light shine before men so they may see your works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're not called to produce fruits for no reason. And Psalms 90 verse 17 says, let the beauty of the Lord establish the work of your hands. In producing fruits, there's two key things. You see God's glory and people see it too. And if we're producing this fruit for God, we know it's by God. It sustains our faith. It keeps us going. And this is the beauty that I want us all to recognize as children of God. But at the same time, if you've never experienced this, or you didn't know that it was a possibility for God to sustain you in the very same way, then I don't just urge you, I plead with you to seek Jesus. Because he is the one that promises to sustain you. And somebody promising to sustain you here and thereafter is a promise that you can bank on because you can take it to him and say, this is what you promised me. Christianity says, I will prove to you here and thereafter. You will experience glory here and mansions in heaven. Jesus offers two. And so you will have proof before you that this is the God that I serve and he's proved it to me. And if you've never had that revelation, you've never had that understanding of God, I urge you, could all the ministers in the room stand up? The deacons, the elders, anybody who's in the room, could they stand up, please? These guys, I think there's a couple more that are outside. Myself, some of these, oh, some of them are here. We've got power there. If you're at a point where you're thinking, I want to know more about this. I want to have my life situated in proximity to God so that he can pour into me. That my life can be his that he can sustain. Reflect on it and make that decision. I want to give my life to Christ and speak to these guys. They'll help you on that journey. Make that decision and commit. It's important. It's necessary. And guys, there's no words that I can give that will articulate properly the glory of God. My words cannot do it justice. The treasures that are hidden within Christ, my words will never be able to summarize. But what I can tell you is that it's changed my life and it's changed the life of many people in here. And a life-changing thing that people are willing to die for must be worth seeking out. And so I urge you guys, if you don't know Jesus, know Jesus. And if you do know Jesus, make him known. Thank you.